So as you can tell, today is not a usual day. Today is an historic day. It's the day of Professor David Gree's final lecture before re-retirement. Yes, that's right, re-retirement. So allow me to take a moment to remind us all of Professor Gree's career. He was born in Flushing, New York. He earned a BS from Queens College in 1960. Then he worked as a mathematician programmer. He went to Illinois and earned a master's degree in 1963. That was in math. Then he became involved in writing an Algol compiler, which he has told us about a little bit before in this class, uh, for the IBM 7090 computer. That led to him going to Munich and earning his doctorate, still in math, in 1966. He became an assistant professor of computer science at Stanford from 1966 to 69. And then in 1969, he moved to Cornell where he was promoted to associate and then full professor, and then briefly demoted to department chair. I mean, pressed into service. I mean, I don't know. He became department chair in 1982. He also served as chair of the CRA, the Computing Research Association, in the late 1980s, when it opened its office in Washington, DC, to represent the interests of computer science to policymakers. In the late 80s and early 90s, he received four different national awards for education in computer science. And locally at Cornell, he was one of the first 10 faculty to receive the university's highest award for teaching, the Weiss Fellow Award. In 99, he received an honorary doctorate from Miami University, my own undergraduate alma mater. He served as editor for Springer Verlag Texts in Computer Science, communications of the ACM and a few other journals over a 30-year time period. Professor Grease retired from Cornell for the first time in 1999 and moved away for a few years. Realizing the error of his ways, he came back in 2003 and became the associate dean for undergraduate programs in the engineering college. In 2011, he resigned that post only to start teaching CS 1110 and 2110 nonstop until today. Now, when I applied to Cornell as a PhD student back in 99, it was originally with the thought of studying with him as an advisor. That didn't work out in part because of his, his brief absence from Cornell, but it has been my honor to co-teach CS 2110 with him several times. You might not know that Professor Grease is a master of the art form known as the limerick. Now, the first time he and I co-taught together was in 2019. And on the occasion of the first lecture of that semester, I wrote my own feeble limerick in honor of him. And I'll close my remarks today by repeating some of it, but update it a bit as well. So this is a limerick in honor of David Grease. There once was a man named Grease who got his doctorate overseas. For what, you inquire? An Algol compiler whose syntax gave birth to C's. Lately, the Grease teaches Java. His path has been a saga. He's retired twice. Wouldn't that be nice? He re-returned because teachings is nirvana. Our co-teachings know coincidence. In fact, it makes perfect sense. My college, Miami, gave him a degree, impressed by his years of experience. So thanks for this last semester, as we studied OO together. Now we come to the end of 2110 and bid adieu to Grease, our professor. Hi, everybody. I wasn't expecting all of that. And I thank all of these people for coming. I've known for so many years, even past deans, uh, uh, faculty. Uh, what, was, what, what was your job, Ed Lone? Anyway, there's lots of people here. Thank you so much for coming. I really wasn't expecting it. 
These, this last lecture is, is hard to give, mainly because I haven't had to give one before. Um, um, anyway, let me start. And I have trouble with glasses because I need them to see. But I can't, I need it for distance, not for looking up close. So this, as you know, is the last lecture in two ways. I've been teaching as a faculty member since 1966. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than uh, uh, my friend and colleague was. Um, it's 56 years, 112 semesters. I'm 83 years. It's time to stop. <laughs> a bit of history. I was born in and grew up in Queens, New York. My father was a professor of classics and a teaching award winner himself at Queens College. I went to elementary school and to a high school in New York, Queens, and then I went to Queens College where my father taught. I was initially going to be an electrical engineer, spending two years at Queens College and then three at Columbia in Manhattan. So I'd end up with a BS from Queens and a master's degree from Columbia. But in my second year, I didn't want to travel into the city every day. That would be horrible. I first had to get to the bus stop, and then I had to take a 50-minute bus ride and then wait for the train into Manhattan and switch trains and so on. So I decided to switch my majors major so that I could continue at Queens. How is that for choosing a major? <laughs> well, that's what it was. Your life decisions, any of your decisions, won't be based solely on rational thinking. Rationally, I should have gone into New York City, but I couldn't. It's going to be based on lots of things, your feelings, your emotions, your intuition, They'll all play a significant role, and don't just try to make it on a rational decision. Some of you have, uh, I have had it fairly easy from a standpoint of money. We've never really had a lot of money, but some of you have real problems with financial aid and so on, and that somehow comes into your decisions of making. I'm sorry for that. We try to do as best as we can to help you out. Okay. So that's it. I was lucky, and that decision led to a good life in computing science. I continued in math at Queens College, and in fall, as a senior, I took a course, my only course that I ever took in computer science, writing subroutines in assembly language of a fake machine. Well, there is Fortran. You might know Fortran here. That is Fortran. And this is the assembly language of the machine itself. That's the way we had to write. But I didn't have a computer. My family didn't have a computer. Queens College did not have a computer. Very few institutions had a computer. And so we didn't have the computer. We didn't have smartphones. If we had to make a call and we weren't home, we had to go look it up. I remember taking a long trip to see my brother here in 1960. He was a veterinarian student. It took nine hours to travel from New York City to Ithaca because there was no interstate, no big roads. And when I got to community corners, I didn't know where he lived because we didn't have GPS. So I had to call him and I went into a tel telephone booth. We did not even have credit cards at that time. Can you imagine a world without credit cards? Well, it was really nice. <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't get a lot of debt. Of course, I do remember a problem I had. I won't go into compute, complete details, but I was traveling from where I was working in 1960 from my house to my work down in Dogon, Virginia, and my car broke down. I didn't have any money in my pocket. I had my checkbook, which showed how great I was, earning a lot of money, and I could show I could have money in it. Um, but, and I went to the bank and asked them to please wire 
my bank and send the money. They said, that'll be $10. I said, I don't have $10. That's why I'm asking you to buy. They said, until you give us $10, we're not going to do it. I guess I look like one of these scroungy little kids who thinks he's good. Uh, so what I had to do was walk around from store to store asking someone, will you please take a check for $10? And at the end, when as soon as I get my money from the bank, I'll come give it to you. I spent the whole day doing that. That is what it was. And finally, some lady took pity on me and did it, but she said, this is not for the store. I'm doing this personally. Anyway, that's the kind of what we lived in at the time. Um, the changes of, in the world have been momentous, as you see. We now have computers, we now have phones, we now have credit cards. At the same time, there's something else that I didn't realize was wrong at the time. That's a picture from the 1980-68 NATO conference on software engineering. Many of you have seen this because we talked about it a little bit. The problem there is you don't see any women. The problem is not that we all had to wear stuffy suits, it's that there were very few women. And that's something uh, that we really had to change. We didn't recognize that today and then, but we do now. And we, our department is working feverishly to change that, to get women, people of color, Latinos, all what's called disadvantaged people into computing because it's good for them, it's good for us, and it's good for the world. We can now know we have Kavita Bala. She is our dean. We have a dean who's a woman. And she's doing, she's doing a far better job than I ever could at that. I don't know how she, and you can see uh, it's, she's a dean, not because she wanted to be uh, an, an administrator, it's because she was good at everything she did. Lots of awards, lots of work, formed a company, and so on. And I'm so glad we have Kavita as our head. Here's a little bit of short history. Uh, my friend, I don't think he is my friend with what he did earlier. Um, uh, <laughs> I started as a mathematician programmer at the U.S. Naval Weapons Lab in Dahlgren, Virginia. I knew I wanted to be a mathematician, but I didn't know what mathematicians did. And so they hired me as a mathematician programmer. They taught us program Fortran in one week, and then we were professional programmers. What's the matter with you people? How long is it taking you? <laughs> A year, two years later, my wife and I decided to go back to college, and we ended up at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, in mathematics, because they didn't have computer science. But there was a computer science program going, and I was hired as a TA, as an RA, to help two Germans write an ALGO 60 compiler. Now, I knew nothing about compilers at that time. Of course, I had used the fourth compiler, I knew nothing about them. I learned later, I, I knew, uh, well, let's just say this. I wrote my compiler. Uh, these two Germans actually designed it. They would give me flow charts and instructions and so on. And I would, along with a few others, but the few others weren't as good as I was at this since I had programmed a lot in this language. I, we wrote a compiler in that language that you see on the screen. And further than that, we use punch cards. How many of you have ever seen a punch card? Ah, not that many of you. Well, that's what they look like. And here you can see somebody punching cards. The blank cards are here. You type, and they come in, and they end up there. And if you mistake, make a mistake on a card, you throw it away and type it again. Here is somebody with a deck of cards. And I hope he didn't drop them. And here is Olin Library, which always reminds me of a punch card. <laughs> <laughs> well,
Well, I helped these two Germans write the compiler, and I was doing such a good job at following what they had written, I was learning what a compiler was myself at the time, that in January, February, they, were, they knew they were going to go back to Germany, and they asked me, why don't you come to Germany and get your PhD there? And under their breath, they said, where well, we can make sure you finish the compiler. Well, that's why I went to Germany. And for a year or so, I did not, um, all I did was finish that compiler. I didn't have to take any courses. As I told you, I only took one course on computing, and that was to uh, learn about a fake assembly language and a, or a fake machine. Uh, they didn't require us to take courses. There was some research going on, and I went and listened and, and, at people talking about their research projects, but there wasn't any need for me to actually uh, take a course. All I had to do was to gain the trust of my, my advisor, guided by the name of Fritz Bauer, who was the one who started that, who, who ran that uh, NATO school, uh, NATO conference I told you about. And when I had finished the compiler, I started talking to him about PhD work. He wanted me to do math. I would rather have done something in compiling, but that wasn't kosher yet. Nobody was writing PhDs in compiler writing. And so I would go to him, and he would give me uh, a topic, something to think about, and I never got anywhere with it. And I would go back to him, and a little bit differently, I started getting really worried about what I was going to do. It was tough. I had no idea how to do research, how to work on these things, and so on. I thought, maybe I should quit this peer. PhD stuff and go work for IBM and show them how to write a compiler. Actually, of course, I thought I knew everything about compiler writing be compilers because I had written one based on other people's design. So here I was spending my nights worrying about this. My wife's there with me. She's working at Siemens for computers, but she would rather go home. And, and, and this is going on for a year. I worried, and I worried, and I worried about it. What was I going to do? This went on for many months. And this is something that all of you, uh, many of you will have trouble with. At some point, you will get to, to a point where you do not understand what you're doing. You want to learn further, but, but you're not making progress. Uh, this is something I tell you because it looks like I'm a story professor, everything has gone on well. It hasn't. We're all going to have problems at some time in life. We may hide it from others. Every one of us has skeletons in our closets, which we don't allow other people to see. So realize that about the people around you. So I got the topic. I spoke to a guy named Josef Stur, an assistant professor, I will call him there. He suggested a topic and said, hey, you write your thesis on this topic, this was in May, and next January I will give a talk on it at a conference in New York. And I said, that's fine. I had to read five papers to know exactly what the field was about. That's all. After all these whole year of worrying, everything came out nice. I spent about seven months writing it, finding theorems and so on, on numerical analysis, theory of norms. The big part was then having, telling my, my, uh, my real professor, Dr. Sh uh, not Stur, but my uh, real Dr. Uh, Vater, um, Fritz Bauer, um, getting him to read it. I would go into his office, and all of a sudden the phone would ring. Or his secretary would come in and say, you got to do this. I never could get him to read the thesis. Finally, one Thursday, I said, Professor Bauer, tomorrow I am coming over your house on Saturday, and we're going to read it. Can you imagine telling a professor that, especially in Germany? 
Well, he said, come Friday, spend the night. I have a nice wine cellar. We'll have wine, and the next day we'll read it. And we did. We spent the whole morning reading the thesis. Um, it was written in my very bad German, of course, which wasn't too good. Stura helped me translate it into high German, laughing all the way. But he read it, and that was it. Um, and a few months later, I had my defense of the thesis in 66, and then I was a, a PhD. Actually, it's rerum natura, Dr. Rerum natura, which means rare nut. At least that's how I abbreviated. So I became an assistant professor at Stanford, and three years later I came here to Cornell. So this is what I wanted to tell you. We all have mistakes, we all have difficulties, even failures. They're there because we have to learn from them. Every time something goes wrong in your life, you should ask, what? why did that happen? How can I make sure it doesn't happen again? And it's what we do with these failures, with these mistakes, with these difficulties that matters most. Believe in yourself. Have confidence in yourself. You are all wonderful people. You're here at Cornell because you got the smarts for it. You also have to have the heart, the heart to work, to struggle, and get through it. That is one of the major messages. I'd like to tell you about my son, Paul. Uh, he came to Cornell, and he was not, he had done very well in high school, but he, it was, everything was easy for him. And he ended up failing a course twice. Imagine how that made us feel. He was put on probation. But he had gotten into the engineering college program where you study during the summer and the next fall you go off as an intern. He did that. And he stretched it out to a year. And he had also said somehow he'd never be a professor like me. I work too hard. Uh, he ends up and he comes back and he starts studying and he gets his BS and his M engine computer science. He is now an award-winning professor of computer science in the teaching track at the University of Toronto. So there was a clear failure. He had to learn something. And I can support him in that as much as I can, but I can't tell him, do this, do this, do this. That's at an age, all of you are at the age where you have to find that struggle yourself, find that balance, learn how to overcome the difficulties. And this worked out for him very nicely. Today he teaches computer science, working twice as hard as I am with his teaching. Okay. Uh, let me see what comes next. I would like to tell you a story of one person who is in our, who is a, 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 a Lior Jessica Cole. She is a student at Cornell. And she took, I have to find the right place. She struggled in CS 2110, just as many of you are doing. I have emails from her about tests and this and that. She ended up struggling, but she ended up doing well because she persisted. And she got hooked on computing, I guess partly because of 2110, but also because of other things she was doing. She took info courses. She had been a plant science major, but she found herself turning to computing. She took courses on web design graphics visualization, all sorts of things like that, and she became an information science major, in spite of the struggles she had in this course. All of you, many of you are struggling. Don't be worried about the struggle, persist and get through. Um, she then, let me get this right, she got involved in activities outside the class, and she ended up taking the year off, and she is now off this year. But during the last, uh, during last September, she ended up writing an AI project for the Jewish New Year called Rabarat 
Iowa. Now, I have copied all her web pages here. You can go on the website and look at it, but I want to explain to you what this is. This is a summary. Uh, she says, artificial intelligence is becoming more human every day. Robo Rabbi, if you can't see that, is an artificial intelligence that's learned about humanity and Judaism alike. Now, this is just a prototype. She doesn't have real AI behind it, but it's something she would like to do. Lesson from that activity before. When people become corrupt, it is important for someone to stand up and lead them back in the right direction. This can be seen and so on when Moses leads the people to the promised land. And it's, she would like the AI project, AI system, to actually produce this lesson from the reading. Um, she ends up saying, this is an artificial intelligence that can think and communicate for herself by reading vast amounts of text on the internet to learn how we humans do it. She was asked by me, a human, to summarize the weekly Torah Parsha, and that's it, she did it. Let me go on to the next page, and she says, my name is Lior Cold, and I'm a student at Cornell, and a worldwide model. She is actually a model. Aside from computing, I love reading, art, embarking on creative projects, and meeting new people. And she goes on to say, my passion for computer science stems from an understanding of the incredible power it holds on society. If we don't make a conscious effort to fully grasp the capabilities of our technology, such power can easily be utilized to inflict great societal harms. I believe it is my generation's duty to ensure that technology is utilized for good. And that's for understanding who we are as humans, who, what are computers, and what all that means for our lives. I, I am amazed at this particular paragraph. It sums up something that I believe, but I would never have been able to write it down in that form. And this comes from a student who is, uh, I think she has at least one more year left. Um, so this is one reason I wanted to tell, tell you. But there's more that goes along with this. She is actually a model. And she met somebody along the way in New York who liked the way she looked, and she became a model. And that's one reason she's taking off. But uh, Cornell has this, this digital model show Back in uh, April, it was, and she was featured in it. She makes her own clothing. Uh, she, her physical model will be a male dressed in only spandex shorts and painted blue and so on. Half the money that she makes from this, and I'm going to switch to the next slide, will go into WIC, Women in Computing. So here's somebody who not only is going to make some money, She's putting it into helping the rest of us, all the women here, everybody at Cornell. Um, so I'm going to skip, skip through this. There is the model that she created, and there she is. And she's donating half the preeds from her NFT sale. Now, what the heck is an NFT? How many of you know what an <laughs> NFT is? A uh, few people. I don't, really. It has to do with digital currency. Uh, and, 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 and so on. So I'm going to stop that. These are my impressions of Lior. She wasn't afraid to change her plans in spite of difficulties. She saw what could be her passion and went for it. She speaks about her beliefs and works towards bettering the world. She serves society and works towards righting wrongs. And this is something I hope that all of us should be doing. We shouldn't just be making money for ourselves. If what we do doesn't serve society in some way, then it really isn't good. OK. Each of us has been put in this world. I, I now want to talk to you about uh, one, one saying that I like, and that's bloom where you are planted. Each of us has been put in this world with certain skills, likes, dislikes, 
Our task is to investigate, to find these skills, to find our passion and follow it through. And in doing so, we shouldn't be trying to emulate others. Jill might be making lots of money. Ooh, I should try to do what she's doing. Jack may be very famous because of his leadership qualities and so on. I should try to do what he does. That's not the case. You have to find your way in this world. You can learn from others, but it's your way. You, you have been put on this world to do something. You have to find it and do it. And that's the, one of the most important things I think I can tell you. Um, it's your way. You can't just emulate other people. Um, your college education isn't so much for earning a living, it's for learning about life. Too much of our attention is spent on how can I get an education to get a good job and make money. That's not the whole thing. The whole, the whole reason is to find out what is your passion and how could you turn that into a good living. Here's something that somebody success said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you like what you're doing, you will be successful. I'd like to close by saying, find out what is right for you. Yes, bloom where you are planted. At the same time, you've got to realize that bloom will fade. Mine is fading. I've been at it for 60 years. I got to get out of the way and let all of these people that you see with shirts with my picture, let them do it. They're much younger than I. They know a lot more than I do about the world of technology and, and really the world itself than I do. It's time for me to get out of the way. And therefore, I say goodbye to all of you and thank you so much. I was honored to be invited to speak today at David Grease's final lecture. David reached out to me and then gave me very clear instructions on what I should do. He said I was not to focus on him and focus on the future. And I thought, you know, once a teacher, always a teacher. It doesn't matter if this is your final lecture, you're still giving instructions to people on what they should do. <laughs> and like most students in Grease's lifetime, I'm only going to pay partial attention to his very clear instructions to me. We all know David Greece in many ways. You know Greece probably by this depiction of him uh, in the time that he spent in our department before his first retirement. That was a picture of him in 1968. But I was able to find this pre-bearded Greece photo uh, from 1966, in case you wondered what does a Greece look like when without a beard. Another way you may know Greece is as a Halloween figure. We had a student in Greece wander the hallways in 2019, shirt, backpack, beard, glasses, and all. And you surely know Greece by this now very, very famous meme, <laughs> or infamous Cornell meme. But then there's even AI that knows. So Greece spoke a lot about AI. I didn't know he would do that. Even AI knows about Greece. So many of you have heard about the large language models like GPT-3 that are trained to produce AI models that can answer questions. So when we gave this prompt to GPT-3 about programming languages and who are the great scientists in programming languages, GPT-3 gave this answer about the greatest computer scientists in programming languages. Don't underestimate this result. These are giants, Edgar Dijkstra, Tony Hoare, Robin Milner, and David Greece, our living legend, is among them. So Greece joined the Cornell Computer. Oops, I'll do that later. Greece joined the Cornell Computer Science Department. I'll let you enjoy this. Uh, he joined the Computer Science Department in 1969, served as its chair, as Michael mentioned, 1982 to 87, then left and came back in 2003. I'll talk a bit about the very, very famous books that you've heard a little bit about. So he wrote his first textbook on compiler writing, Compiler Construction for Digital Computers, in 1971. He got involved way back then in intro programming teaching. It has been a lifetime endeavor. So this was CS211, 
which is the precursor to 2110 that he has, of course, spent decades teaching. He wrote an influential book at the time with Dick Conway, An Introduction to Programming, A Structured Approach. And he worked with Dijkstra and was one of the pioneers of the field that is now called programming methodology. That's somebody's alarm. Good. OK. Yes, you should wake up and listen. <laughs> he made seminal contributions to the formal reasoning of programs. And his most famous book, the one that GPT-3 is talking about, is The Science of Programming, which was written in 1981 and based on the work of that time. He wrote his book with Fred Schneider on a logical approach to discrete math, which was the textbook for 280, which became the precursor to 2800. And he's a famously engaged editor who made generations of computer scientists better writers, whether they wanted it or not. The claim is that he really extensively edited documents and iterated extensively before people could get their writing through him, but they improved from it. And his impact on education, of course, went well beyond Cornell. He's played an instrumental role in the national education of computer science, and he has received many accolades for his teaching. Last week, he was voted the Tau Beta Pi Professor of the Year, thanks to all of you voting probably in that, in that election. And he will receive the Bowers uh, Computing and Information Science Lifetime Achievement Award for teaching this week. But more importantly, Greece has received pretty much every important national award for an educator there is. The IEEE Taylor Booth Award, the ACM Carl Karlstrom Award, the ACM SIG CSE Award, and the AFIPS Education Award. He also created future leaders and pioneers. Susan Owiki, Susan Graham, Jennifer Widim are three of his very early students who went on to become professors at Stanford and Berkeley and were really some of the earliest female faculty in the field of computer science. And he's always been proud of his work with TV Raman on accessibility, which won Raman the ACM Dissertation Award. Greece was chair of the Computing Research Board, and he spearheaded his becoming the current day CRA. And the CRA plays a very big role in computer science research and education interests. So that is Greece, the computer scientist. But then there is Greece, the colleague. He has never been a stuffy guy. He has a wicked sense of humor. He writes limericks, as I had assumed you already knew. But if you didn't know, yes, he spent his whole lifetime writing limericks to the joy of all of us in the department. And he sometimes got into trouble with the authorities with his limericks, too. I'll let you go and check those out on the web page. Uh, but today, I thought I'd get Greece to perform two of his limericks, one from 95. So you'll get a live performance of a Greece limerick. This one was from 95, and it was called, of course, a glimmerick of hope. He's big into puns. You, you're mic'd up? That, that, uh, my mic is on, I think. That was given at a banquet speech in a con in, in a conference in Limerick, Ireland. <laughs> and how could you not write limericks for it? The world is turning to see, though at best it is taught awkwardly. But we don't have to mope. There's a glimmer of hope in the methods of formality. For some of us, I had not yet joined the computer science department. To this day, I remember Eurus Hartmanis was retiring, I think it was 2001. And Greece put on, he was the MC of the show, and it was, he had all of us, 150, 100 plus, 550 of us, laughing for three hours straight. I don't have limericks from that one, but then at the 40th celebration for the computer science department in 2005, he produced the ABC book, so you should go and look at that on his website too. And you can also see many of us looking like babies in that picture, because we were. Uh, but uh, this was from 2005, and this yes. is a limerick. Because he told me to focus on the future, I felt we should pick this one for him to talk about. The two H's here were Hartmanis, who had retired in 2001, and John Hopcroft, who actually retired over COVID. And I hope I can get him back to come and it's talk to us. It's not really a limerick. It's just a poem. All right, fine. Sorry. I and you can see people there. There is Fred Schneider. Yes. Because all of us are there. Well, all of us who were there in the department Everybody are there. Everybody is there. Yep. Um, why are young faculty, which every depth needs, upon their work the depth's fame proceeds? When did the H's win touring awards? That's Art Madison. When they were old and bored and on boards, when was the work that gave them reward? 10 years from cutting their footbillical cord. That was a running gag that the PhD was the foot. Yes. But um, it, it had to be because 
PhD didn't rhyme very well. Yeah, that's just <laughs> <laughs> poetic license. His ability to make us laugh is going to be sorely missed, but I hope he'll come by and keep making us laugh. So Greece wanted me to focus on the future in this uh, conversation, and I thought I could start by talking about his impact on me. I was the only female computer scientist uh, in my class in India. And I need, uh, knew about David not, of course, as a person. I was over in India. I knew about him through his books. This was long before I ever met him as a person. As a female student, I was told at that time by many that I did not belong in computer science. I was told a woman should be seen and not heard. And in Greece's books, I found knowledge. Well, that was to be expected. They were textbooks. But in the clear thinking and writing of his books, I found beauty. And that was surprising to me. But most importantly for me, through his books, I found a path to computer science. And for me, that was a path to intellectual freedom, to belonging in a field that I knew was the right field for me, no matter what people told me. So when Greece wrote his books, I can't imagine that he realized this kind of staggering impact his work would have, not only on generations to come, but on students across the world, random kids in India like I was at that time. Something I did not know then, but found out later, was that Greece traveled to India and helped teach students in various not-so-privileged institutions there for many years. And he continued to do that for a while. So I'll wrap up here. Greece asked me to talk about the future, so I will. Apart from his zany sense of humor, apart from his great books with their long-lasting influence, apart from his research and his impact through his own students, and apart from his teaching and how it has changed how students think, what stands out to me most about David is his deep commitment to educating future generations. For people like David, this is not a profession, it is not a career, it is a calling to which he has dedicated his entire life. So few have, very few have done as much as David Greece has done for computer science education. He inspires his fellow faculty members, all of us here who are in the t-shirt, to be the best educators and mentors we can be. And in fact, this is what I believe makes Cornell CS stand out among the great computer science departments of the world. There is one and only one David Greece, and none of us can become a Greece. But whether you become an educator or not, I hope you will mentor and support future generations the way David Greece has given to the future his entire lifetime. The one and only David Joseph Greece. Thank you. Thank you. Look at that. Oh, it's been wonderful.